Today's guest can be best described in a singular word, Titan. Not only is he a writer, educator, consultant, but he is a tour de force in the world of wine, and especially well known for his contributions to the Israeli wine industry. Highly respected, it is a privilege to have this gentleman on our show. His name is Adam Montefiore. Thank you for joining us, Adam. Dr. Lee, thank you very much. It's, I have to say it's a great privilege to be on, on this program uh, with, with you. I mean, it's very prestigious. It's a place to be seen. And um, thank you for inviting me. It's our pleasure indeed, Adam. Now, Adam, your name, Montefiore, it means flower mountain, and it has a very rich heritage. Could you share with us and let others know about your family story? Of course, the name Montefiore is Italian. Uh, it comes from the Ancona coast of, uh, of Italy, um, where there is a couple of villages by the name of Montefiore. Um, and the family presumably took its name from these villages. Um, then uh, the family moved to Livorno in Tuscany, which is uh, uh, nice considering I was to work later in wine. And, and then for uh, economic reasons, they moved to England. Um, and, um, and I'm the first of the family to, to arrive in Israel. Um, and of course, my famous forebear was Sir Moses Montefiore, who was, really was a titan of the 19th century. He was a forerunner of Zionism um, and um, a great supporter of, um, of uh, the uh, beginnings of the settlement of, of, of Israel. Uh, he built the first uh, neighborhood outside the old city walls of Jerusalem and also was a great encourager for Jews to return to agriculture, which eventually led to, to planting vines. Um, so uh, it's quite a nice story. And fin finally, he drank a bottle of uh, wine every day of his life and lived to 100, nearly 101, which was an astonishing age in the 19th century. Um, and he drank port. And um, so I, I feel somehow this was in my genes. I, I, I think uh, definitely the, those genes of pioneering flow uh, in your veins, uh, Adam. And um, do you enjoy port yourself? Um, I love the region. I think the Duro is, what is so beautiful that it's sort of heaven on earth. Um, I, I do love port, um, but I don't drink it much as, as a lot of people don't these days. But there's lots of new wonderful wines, table wines coming out of the Douro these days. So, um, but, but do I drink it? I think we have so many more options uh, today. So it's very hard to say you only drink one, one style of wine when yes. the world, you know, look how much uh, what a wine list has changed over the last 30 years. So, oh, it, so there's so much variety in this places, even like Israel making good wine, which- That's very to, true. Um, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, the, the Douro, it's, it's majestic, it's calm, it's furious, it seeps and oozes with tradition. So um, I would certainly yes. agree with you there. Now, Absolutely. <laughs> Adam, you, you clearly, you speak many languages because, I, I, you know, the name and then Italy and uh, you've lived in England and uh, you mentioned there was a Spanish and a Portuguese heritage. Do, do you speak any of those languages? Um, not really. I mean, I, I really speak uh, mainly two, two languages badly, which is English and Hebrew. Um, and um, uh, but uh, I was a, a part of the Spanish and Portuguese Jewish community in London. Um, and um, the family came from Italy, but a long time before. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really very English, uh, English Israeli uh, add on. Uh, with a touch of Morocco thrown in, you know, like all Jewish families, they've moved around a lot. Um, so we, like every Jewish family, we have a very rich uh, background. Oh, definitively rich. And um, I think that you are all the better for it as we all are when we, we amalgamate all the different cultures that we have uh, in our own personal story. Now, how did this wondrous wine adventure begin for you, Adam? 
Well, I, I began uh, in the beer industry. I joined a company oh. called Bus Charrington, which was then the biggest uh, brewer in uh, uh, brewer in England, and they had the most pubs, and uh, then they became one of the biggest hoteliers in the world. And they also had wine interests. They owned Hedges and Butler, which was a 300-year-old wine and spirit shipper. They owned Chateau Lascombe from Margot. Uh, they owned Alexis Lachine, bought from the famous Alex Lachine. And gradually, I moved from the, uh, from the beer interest uh, uh, to wine. And while in England, I became wine manager of their uh, hotel division. And, um, and that was uh, a transfer fully into, into the wine business where I've been ever since. That's, that, that is certainly a journey. And, you know, your experience has given you and cut into your character many different facets, vital, vital um, areas that um, anyone wanting to excel in the wine industry should have exposure to them. Now, you're very well respected, Adam, and you're known for your pioneering firsts in the wine industry in Israel. For example, the Yarden Award for Wine Service. Would you share with us and uh, the other firsts that you're most proud of and the significance relating to the Israeli wine industry? Well, I, I was very proud while I, while I was still in England. I was a founder member of the Academy of Wine Service um, and honorary member, um, which was started, uh, you know, there were many success has many fathers, but I was one of the people that supported it from the beginning. I came to Israel, I organized the first sommelier uh, wine service uh, course. Um, I ran uh, the first uh, Yarden Award for wine service, which was a wine waiter competition, uh, which I also used to run in England in the hotel chain. Um, I realized how good uh, a competition was for education. And um, I'll give you an example. When I was in England, there was a young wine waiter who took part in the competition. And after I left for Israel, and he, he went out in the first round. And after I went to, to Israel, I found out that he won the event the year after I left. So, so that to me is classic. It was, gave him the inspiration and the, the incentive to study and learn. And from being knocked out in the first round, he eventually turned out to be a winner. So I realized in wine education, uh, a, a wine waiter competition, uh, explaining and teaching and inspiring was very important. And that was the Arden Award for Wine Service, which is still the main uh, wine waiter competition in, in Israel. Um, I formed Handcrafted Wines of Israel, uh, which was uh, 10 small, what we call in Israel, boutique wineries, but in France, uh, we, we would say small wineries or garagistes. Um, and this was the first time Brand Israel was sold together um, in, in, under, one, uh, under, one, under one hat. And we had some pretty good wineries. We had Castel and Margalit and Sorah and Flam and Yatir. And these are some of the top wineries today. So that was um, uh, a good uh, example to Israeli wineries with the benefit of working together. Um, I formed... Um, uh, a wine culture center. Uh, we called it Wine and Culture, which was like a, um, a fusion between wine tourism and wine education, which was pretty unique. Um, and um, I've always been interested in, in doing, doing things differently if I could. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I made, we made um, a, a whiskey um, at Bruchladik, uh, which was aged in uh, kosher wine casks. And this was the first uh, kosher wine cask finish of a, of a whiskey. So, so I've always had my little babies and my little interests, which I'm quite happy to do. And now, of course, it's quite common, but it, then it was the first. So I enjoy um, trying to innovate and trying to uh, think out of the box and have my own pet babies and, and, and uh, some work and some don't. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm part of a, a juggernaut. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to play part in the, in the development of Israeli wine, which was still a minnow, but uh, there's been a lot of development over the last 20, 30 years.
Oh, yes, it's starting to begin to soar like an eagle. I remember talking about that whiskey. I once had to give a, um, a whiskey tasting to a group of um, Jewish uh, people, and I had to call up the New York City um, uh, rabbi from one of the synagogues and ask him about kosher whiskey. So that was a huge learning experience for me. It's well. very complicated. Any, any time very... you talk religion, is very complicated, very hard to explain. Um, and there's a lot of belief involved. So uh, the people that believe in it, uh, belief helps them get over the, the hurdles. And for the rest of us, we, um, you know, we respect anyone who has uh, uh, a wish uh, for kosher wine or um, uh, wine uh, made in a certain way. And because it doesn't affect quality, uh, you know, the winemaking is the same. The grapes yes. are the same. The winemakers studied in the same place. The fermentation is the same. Uh, the aging is the same. The bottling is the same. So, so a bad kosher wine is, is a bad wine. Uh, it's not bad because it's kosher. Um, you can have a great wine that's kosher. Um, so uh, um, once, you, once you get over that hurdle, you realize that the world is your oyster. Yes, yes. To definitely. use a bad phrase, because oyster's not, a, not kosher, but uh, never mind. <laughs> but I think the, the appropriate and, and uh, word that you used was respect. You know, yes, we, absolutely. We, we just give respect to that. Now, Adam, absolutely. what has been the significance for you personally to become the ambassador of Israeli wines? Well, I'm not an official ambassador. I've become an ambassador by default yes. because I... Um, uh, found myself presenting Israeli wine so often abroad mm. because I'm an English speaker and because I came from the English wine trade, I, um, I found myself almost as a sort of spokesman and became involved in all sorts of ways. For instance, I, I'd done the rankings uh, or the, the pages for Israel in the Hugh Johnson Pocket Wine Book for over 25 years now. And I write the English section, uh, uh, sorry, the Israeli section and the kosher section in the um, in the wine, the Oxford wine uh, in, uh, companion um, of Jancis Robinson. Yes, so, Francis. Uh, so I um, I've become sort of by default an a prominent ambassador, but we don't have an amb the ambassador. Uh, but I but I've been as, pro as prominent as anyone, and um, I consider it a real privilege to be to be at the forefront or or the crest of the wave of, of Israeli wine. You know, we have no, uh, we know how small we are and we're not gonna be France or Italy tomorrow. Um, but uh, when you look where we were 20 years ago, where we might be in another 20 years, it's very exciting. And the world is getting bigger in terms of wine. And therefore the more exotic, unknown, unusual countries uh, certainly create a lot of interest. So it's, it's great to be part of that. So um, I consider myself like the English voice of Israeli wine, um, uh, or that's what I've been called. Uh, and uh, I'm an ambassador amongst many good ambassadors trying to, to uh, make the case for Israeli wine. Well, I think not only English, but certainly on the international scale and platform, Adam. And uh, it's, it's uh, acknowledged that you are the cornerstone. So. Clearly, you're, you're very <laughs> humble, but uh, you are definitely the cornerstone of protruding and pushing forward and advancing, you know, Israeli wine. Now, you mentioned, you know, age. Looking back to the last 20 years in the wine industry in Israel, how would you describe the progress to date in terms of the number of wineries, the quality issues, and the economic barriers to entry? For Israeli wine? Um, it, it's a kind of miracle. I mean, I made, I came to Israel in 1989. Then I think there were 12 wineries and probably one commercial winery, uh, which had 75% uh, of the market, which was Car Carmel, um, the historic winery of Israel. Um, and now we have 350, and that doesn't include all the garages and domestic wineries making wine at home and with some good wines amongst those two. Um, the quality has improved no end. The variety of winemakers um, who have studied abroad all over the world, 
I mean, once we just had winemakers go to UC Davis, now they go to every wine school there is on the map, uh, winemaking school all over the world from Australia to Montpellier to Davis to wherever. Um, and then they come back to Israel as young, um, uh, dynamic, uh, knowledgeable uh, wine uh, making force, each one with his own um, uh, image that he's trying to create or own aspiration. And so we're a melting pot of, um, of people that have studied all over the world. Um, and it's a very dynamic, youth led, knowledgeable market. Um, and we've, we've gone through a few stages in Israeli wine. Uh, firstly, we started making good wine, which was, which was after 5,000 years of pr trying, it was about time. So we started making good wine that won awards. Uh, we had a winery, the Golan Heights Winery, our then wines started winning awards and people thought, oh, Israel can make good wines. Then we went through the varietal stage when everyone was making varietals and we had big Cabernets and uh, Oki Chardonnays and and uh, started making Israeli varietals. Now we're getting more to blends from regions. So we're getting more regional. Now, one of the most fascinating things about Israel is we're a very small country, but we're long and thin. And like long and thin countries like Chile and Italy, we have enormous microclimates. So we have a harvest that lasts from mid-July uh, to the end of October, and sometimes on the Golan Heights, it can go to the first week of November. That's a very long harvest. Um, and um, we, uh, we have a lot of variety. Uh, the south of the country is desert, uh, total desert. And if you fly down to Alat from Tel Aviv and you look out the window, you'll find a little square of green amongst the desert and someone's planting a vineyard. So, it's, uh, it's moving, you know, to see it. It's amazing to see it. Israelis is making the desert bloom with vineyards. So we're, um, and yet you're on the Golan Heights, you've got a snow covered mountain where you can go on a ski slope. So, so it's a country of a lot of variety um, and we make a lot of different wines as a result. Now, what about, what about barriers to entry in terms of markets? You know, is everyone receptive to Israeli wines? Well, we, ha we have, um, let, let's, let's be honest, we, have, um, we sometimes have political problems. Um, we sometimes have uh, kosher problems. You know, people think kosher wine is sweet or, or um, sweet oxidized sugar water. Um, but of course, the kosher wine has got nothing to do with sacramental wine. Sacramental wine, it's like altar or communion wine is to, is to normal wine. It's a, it's a different product. Mm -hmm. So uh, sacramental wine is, um, is kosher, but it's not a table wine. So we, we make quality table wines. And um, uh, sometimes there is a reputation that people uh, in, in America think Israeli wines are like Manischewitz or, or in England, they think it's like Palwin, which are the equivalent sort of wines. Um, so the kosher problem, the, the um, political problem sometimes rears its head even though most people feel that making wine is a very peaceful, productive, yes. uh, productive, you know, more people would plant vineyards and make wine and, and drink less coffee. In our region, it would be a far more simple, uh, peaceful place. So um, the main problem is that Israel is tiny. I mean, we'd fit into New Jersey. We make, make less wine than Gallo of Sonoma. Um, and that means that we, uh, we can't, we don't have the, the quantity and therefore the price to sell brand Israel in, in the supermarkets or in the right. mass markets. So whereas Chile, South Africa, Argentina, Australia all came in and attacked first in England and then the rest of the world, they attacked the, the mass market and built a brand. Uh, Israel can never do that because we don't have enough wine and we don't have the uh, low enough prices, uh, but that can also be a good thing. It means we're not going to have an image for uh, cut price quality. Uh, you know, uh, some people might say that Chile has a problem uh, because they're so well known for good value wines that to raise to rise up again uh, is is difficult. Where Israel's starting high, a bit like New Zealand, 
Um, and we have to, our main market has to be wine shops and wine restaurants. Um, so uh, um, we, we haven't got the volume to, to really uh, attract attention and to, for a advertising program uh, in the mass market. So we have to be smart and realize where we are. So one is competing with the shield and the sword of quality. Uh, which is uh, we're, we're trying to, and also uh, being different. Yes. Because uh, wine, you know, we've, we've passed the, the varietal revolution in uh, the new world, and now people have gone back to talking place again. So people are interested in wines from the Negev uh, desert, wines from the Galilee, where Jesus made wine, uh, turned water into wine. Uh, wines from the Jerusalem hills or the Judean hills on the way yeah. to Jerusalem. Um, and each one of these is totally different. Um, uh, the, you know, the description of the, the soil, the, the altitude, everything is different. Uh, and they're producing wines of different character. And uh, listen, if you have a wine list uh, and you uh, put in the wines of the Eastern Mediterranean and you have an Assertico from Santorini and you have a Chateau Moussa from Lebanon, and a Rhone style blend from Israel, and you add that to your wine list or your wine shop shelf, uh, suddenly you, you've got something a lot more interesting because you might have something that the next restaurant doesn't have. And the Eastern Mediterranean is of course the wine region that gave wine culture to the world. And 2000 years ago, everyone knew what wine from Cyprus and Greece and, and uh, Canaan or, or the Israelites or um, uh, Phoenicia, uh, the Phoenicians, mm -hmm. what wine, what wine from the, the same area that's making wine today was quite familiar to people in ancient times, where wine in France and Italy hadn't been heard of. So we do have this long history. Oh, yeah. We're part of the ancient world, not the old world or the new world. Um, and uh, there's been an absolute turnaround in, in throughout the region, from Greece to Cyprus. Even, even they're making wine in Syria, um, Lebanon, um, uh, Turkey. And um, so it's a, it's a fascinating region. And, and we are part of this. This is our region. This is where we should be on the wine shelves and on the wine lists. And um, we're part of a mosaic, which is part of the history of Israeli wine. And for the wine world, it's quite, it's quite an exotic region because a lot of the people are discovering uh, the Eastern Mediterranean wines for the first time. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I would fall into that category. Although many years ago, the first time I saw Israeli wine, really? So I, I um, tr truly appreciate the, 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 the spectrum of wines that are coming from the ancient world. And, um, you know, which, which brings me to the next question, Adam. We've spoken about the last 20 years. What do you foresee as the major hurdles for the next 20 years for the Israeli wine industry and its competitive edge on the global arena? Um, I think this is, the, this is the, um, the next decade, is the decade of finding our identity. You know, previously people learned to make good wines, but they were blends from all different sorts of regions. Now wineries are looking more to make single vineyard wines, uh, wines from a single area, or to, to identify certain plots in the vineyard. So we're making wines with more identity, more a sense of place now than, than ever before. Um, global warming is a challenge to, to, uh, to everyone in the wine industry. I, I don't think people give it enough thoughts, even though everyone's suddenly talking sustainability and, and with the fires and the floods and Everyone knows what global warming is now, um, but um, Israel is probably the southernmost uh, wine country producing quality wines. Um, and um, that's why uh, to make wine, we, we climb. And even in the desert, um, Israeli vineyards, which were founded by Rothschild in the 19th century in the coastal plain, mm -hmm. have now moved eastwards and northwards in search of high altitude. So we have a lot of vineyards more than 500 meters above sea level, uh, going up to sort of 1,200 meters. And even the vineyards in the desert, which I've talked about, yes. are very high altitude, 800 meters above sea level. 
Uh, and for that, you, it mitigates against the latitude and you get a cooler climate and a longer growing season. Uh, but global warming is, is, a, bit, is a big uh, aspect. Um, I think Israel is, is, in a sense, still has to be discovered. I mean, I, I've been uh, uh, into a restaurant uh, uh, in Boston with a sommelier, with a great Tastavan, and I asked for Israeli wines. And he turned to me uh, and said, do you mean Manischewitz? Uh, and this is someone who's trained in wine. So I realized suddenly Manischewitz is the, the main symbol of the, the antichrist or the anti-kosher uh, qu quality wine, because it's the most simple type of sacramental wine, uh, well known everywhere in America. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it makes me understand we've got a lot of work to do. And even though I've been working with this all my life, we, we've got to continue. And the next generation have got to continue. So uh, Israel still has to be discovered. I think we have to find our, our voice. We have to find our identity. Uh, we have to keep doing quality. And we have to keep making wine at every price point. And this includes the larger wineries in, in, in uh, the relative mass market that they can get to, like Barkan, Carmel, uh, the Golan Heights Winery, uh, Tabor, Tepperberg. Um, they have to uh, also concentrate on, on the quality for value and the cheaper range too. So um, I think if we work together and we concentrate on tastings, 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 uh, to, to, to bring awareness of Israeli wine, to show the variety of wines of the Eastern Mediterranean, because I believe Eastern Mediterranean is, is very much, Mediterranean cuisine is very much in. Uh, Israel cuisine and Israel chefs are conquering the world with their brashness and innovation and chutzpah, um, and, um, and the Israeli wine is part of that. And we're part of, a, of a, an amazing region of his, history. And, and the one thing we have in common is that once we were all under the Ottoman Empire, not so long ago. So um, this is our roots in this region. Uh, and then of course we go back to Bible times, but um, I feel it's a, it's a, for the wine lover, it's a fascinating wine region. It's like a new world, Yes, in the oldest, one of the oldest wine producing regions in the world. So that's the, that's the paradox. Yeah, it's, it's, as you said, discovery. Now, yes. talking about discovery, many wine consumers do not, they don't initially sort of rush to select or even think of Israeli wines when deciding, you know, upon a bottle of wine. What advice would you like to share with the wine consumer out there about the uniqueness and quality of Israeli wines? Well, I think, again, Israel represents the place. And if you're Christian, it's the Holy Land. You can buy wines from Jerusalem and the Galilee. If you're Jewish, we make the best quality and the biggest variety of kosher wines in the world. And I'm not ashamed of the kosher word. The kosher word is, is something that adds value to the label like having vegan or sustainable on the back label. Mm. It's a form of uh, perfectionism, a form of checks, like an ISO um, checklist. Um, so I don't knock kosher at all. I think, um, uh, and for the, for the Jewish wine drinker, it's essential. So the Christians can drink wine from the Holy Land. The Jews can drink uh, the best kosher wines in the world and the biggest variety of kosher wines in the world. Um, for the sommelier or the wine store, right. looking for something a bit exotic, something a bit different, something to set them apart from the, the neighbor down the road, um, then wines from the Eastern Mediterranean uh, is, is, uh, and Israel is an option. Now, 30 years ago, or 35 years ago, as wine manager of a hotel chain, I first understood that Israel on its own was too small and too um, uh, against the giant countries, it was too insignificant. But if you put us as part of an Eastern Mediterranean uh, section and you add in Greece and Lebanon and Israel, and you choose, look at the variety, the history of the wine, then the oh, quality yeah. of the wines in this area, Certainly. and you look at the changes that are happening in Turkey and Cyprus, you realize 
that for the wine sommelier, the wine geek, this is fascinating. I mean, you and I are the type of people, we don't drink Chateau Lafitte every night. And if you see something that you haven't tasted on a wine list, you have to try it. Oh. And Israel's in that category. So we're never going to yes. be the never ca next California, but we can um, um, offer interest, uh, an exotic quality, and a new wine region. And wines are now a sense of place. The Eastern Mediterranean, the place to give wine culture to the world, a new wine world in the oldest wine growing region. I, I know these are slogans I've used, um, where the quality has changed. Uh, we have uh, indigenous varieties. We have um, uh, enormous variety of production. And we fit very well into the mosaic of our region. And to me, it's the most interesting and dynamic wine region in the world today, the Eastern Mediterranean. If you look in the last 20 years, what's happened, there's no wine region that's changed as much as the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and so I think for every person who loves wine, who wants to taste something new, taste something new that is paradoxically old <laughs> and introduce yourself to a whole new world. Certainly. So I, I think we, we're interested, we should be interesting to the wine geek, to the sommelier, to the uh, wine store owner wanting something different, or simply wanting to cover a wine region that, that hasn't been on the wine list before. Maybe Chateau Moussard was on the wine list. So let's, let's add to it. And 30 years ago, when I was wine manager in this hotel chain, that's what I did. I put Yarden wines with Chateau Moussard under the heading Eastern Mediterranean. Right. And I realized it was far easier to market the two wineries together as a story rather than each one under Lebanon and Israel on its own. That's and and, and from, since that day, I've been a fervent advocate um, of the, uh, even a pioneer of marketing the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, I'm sure we're going to see more and more of an expansive range of wines coming from the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, Adam, you mentioned, uh, you know, Israel has its own varieties. Now, when we think of Riesling, oh, Germany comes to mind. New Zealand, oh, that's going to be Sauvignon Blanc. Now, what would you think, or is there already a current signature grape for Israel? Unfortunately, or maybe it's fortunately there isn't, because mm -hmm. even though we've been making wine for 5,000 years, we're 20 years into a really quality uh, uh, wine production. And Israel is a great experiment in. So you tell Israel, uh, an Israeli he can't plant wines in the Negev, he goes and plants wine in the Negev desert. You say this variety won't grow, he'll plant it to show that he can. So we have a lot of varieties here. There are a few standouts if you're looking for something associated with Israel. I mean, our biggest planted variety is today Cabernet Sauvignon, like everywhere else. Right. Um, the uh, the um, inherited or adopted variety is, I suppose, Carignan, Carignan mm -hmm. which has been here for 150 years. Uh, it was planted uh, in the 1880s or even 1870s as a um, workhorse grape. And now we have some old vines and people are making beautiful old vine Carignans. So this is like our adopted variety. Uh, it's almost become it's not Israeli, but it's become, you know, it has been in, been in Israel as long as Malbec has been in Argentina, for instance. Um, then we have other varieties uh, which just seem to be very well suited to our climate, like Petit Syrah mm -hmm. or Grief, like Marcelin, which is a new in the last 10 years, uh, but proving very uh, good here. Um, we have, uh, you know, the, probably the most suited variety to the Eastern Mediterranean, in my opinion, is Syrah or Shiraz, which is great variety for the, the high altitude limestone soils, um, stony soils, hot climate of our Eastern Mediterranean region. And it seems to do well in every country as well as, as, well as Israel. Uh, Grenache is grow, uh, growing well here. Um, Petit Verdot. Uh, I'm drinking a Petit Verdot now, by the way, just by chance. Um, uh, Petit Verdot is a variety that uh, you, as a great expert on Bordeaux, uh, will know uh, Petit Verdot in the past 
uh, in the far past often didn't ripen in Bordeaux. Uh, now, of course, there's less problem with that. Um, but in Israel, there's no problem with ripening. Mm. So it's a variety that has almost replaced Merlot in the quality Bordeaux blend as the second highest percentage in a blend with a lot of wines. And this is a, a, a Petit Verdot varietal. So mm. Petit Verdot is a variety that grows very well here. What will be the future Israeli variety? I don't think there'll be a variety. I think Israel will be known for blends. Uh, we're a very southern latitude country. And like the southern Rhone, Israel is now excelling in innovative blends, either of Mediterranean varieties or Bordeaux varieties mixed with Mediterranean varieties. And I feel that we're going to be a country known for the regions. Um, the Golan Heights, the Galilee, the coastal plain, the Judean mm -hmm. Hills, the Negev, um, as opposed to um, particularly uh, one variety or another. We do have an Israeli red variety called Argaman, uh, which is a cross between Sauzo, the Portuguese variety, mm -hmm. and Carignan, which can make very nice wines. Um, peppery, uh, it's a red with good acidity, refreshing acidity, uh, nice fruit. Um, and then we have what we call the Holy Land indigenous varieties, which have been here forever, which people are just experimenting, you know, like they're doing in every country. Yes. They're also doing in Israel. So we have varieties like Marwawi, Hamdani, Jandali, Dabuki. Oh. They all sound Arabic. And that's, you, of course, they were uh, survived during the time of the Ottoman Empire. A lot were planted in the Hebron area. Uh, by Palestinian-owned vineyards. And now there's a lot of research into making wine for these varieties. So there's lots of interesting things happening, but um, one variety out of all of those, you know, if you asked a lot of people, people might say Petit Verdot, Carignan, or, <laughs> or Petit Sira. I, I think we'll be known as a country of blends. Um, and I think it's suitable to our place on the map. Um, south of a certain level of a certain latitude uh, blends seem to be more popular than varietals uh, and um, uh, but uh, those i've mentioned the main varietals that you'll talk about when you yeah. when you talk about israel yeah and there seems to be a, a sort of a vast array of shelves you know full of varieties that many people have not even heard of let alone tasted so that's something one can look forward to now you know, Adam, you and I, we, we know we've tasted an enormous uh, volume of wines over our career. And this brings us to the point of reviews. Now, recently, as you know, there was um, an article where um, the, the, um, there was a, a statement that said that uh, supposedly reputable publications, one that claimed to be independent, suffer from numerous conflicts of interest. And um, it was stated that as a result of this, this has meant faith in wine reviews have been eroded. And this was written by Lisa Peretti Brown uh, in an article of Meininger's Wine Business International. Now, so, we, so there's that aspect. And we know that there are other reviewers who review 25, thousand wines a year which is a an enormous number i mean i don't know how many tongues one must have in order to to review that but you know the public do rely on that well what it's a staggering amount i mean what what are your thoughts and insights on the value of wine reviews in today's world well i i'm a bit schizophrenic uh i i'm a, i insist these days that i'm a wine writer and not a wine critic uh, I don't give scores. I refuse to give scores. Mm -hmm. For a simple, a simple, uh, for intellectual honesty, I, if I taste a wine now, this uh, Yarden Petit Verdot, uh, I know that in an hour's time or half an hour's time or after I've eaten or whatever, it will be totally different. So when do you give the score? Uh, and how can you say it's honest score? When you, um, you know, most scores are giving in a tasting, as you know, you have a sh what we call in, in Israeli sl slang, a shluk, and the, you know, a, a, a sniff and a taste, yeah, yeah. and then you go on to the next wine and you give a score. 
So I think it's, I think, uh, as, I don't want to be a wine critic like that. I, I consider myself a wine writer, I tell a story, uh, and I refuse to score wines, even though a lot of people have approached me and said, we need an Israeli to replace Daniel Rogoff, who, who is the, the, the critic, our, our famous wine critic who died in uh, 2011. Uh, but I but I don't want to give a score. I don't give a score to a restaurant. I don't give a score to opera. I don't give a score to a concert. Um, so it, it seems inappropriate to give a score to an art form, especially one that's changing in the glass. Uh, and I can't in honestly say that this wine is, you know, my, my two children are in the wine business. And um, we taste, uh, we get together on the Sabbath evening, which is Friday night. Yes. And we often taste wines together. And they're my best partners to taste wine with. And we're, we're all, they've also been in the wine business a long time now. And how many times we've been made fools of? We buy a special wine, we open it, we expect it to show something. And uh, it's disappointing. Yes. And then we go back an hour later or two hours later and, and suddenly our eyes light up and hearts lifted and it's a fantastic wine. So we fall into the same trap. So that sort of experience, which surprises me again and again, uh, encourages me to think that wine criticism, it's a luxury for people with a lot of confidence to do it, that they can say, this is a 90 wine and this is an 89 wine. Um, uh, and um, I, don't, I don't have the brashness to do that. However, I'm schizophrenic as a winery, and I spent most of my, we haven't talked about it, but I spent most of my life working for wineries. Um, uh, as for 27 years working for Israeli wineries. When I was with a winery, I was the first to make a noise if we got a good score from Robert Parker or if we won a competition a gold medal or a trophy. I was the first to do it. Right. And I understand that consumers like it. So, um, so I realize uh, one side that it's important not to take these competitions too seriously. Secondly, as a winery, I always said, don't get too excited if you win. It's not such a big deal and don't get too disappointed if you lose. And uh, I realize it's part of the, um, it's part of the sort of new parkerization hijacked by the Americans, taken on worldwide, this 100 score. And we're, we're stuck with it up to a point. Um, and it helps people, you know, if they can look at a score instead of reading a tasting note, uh, and most tasting notes written commercially, you know, you can read a flowery tasting note and you get nothing out of the wine, you know, it's beautiful, uh, you know, it's a beautiful fruit basket of, of tastes in the wine, but if you can try and compare it with the, with the next wine, it it's, turns out to be very similar. So, so uh, there has to be a balance between the score and the tasting note. I'm very cynical of these people that taste so many wines. I realize it's important. And there is a level of different level of respect. I mean, I once worked for a winery where we got a gold medal in a competition when we didn't send a wine. Uh, and <laughs> that's true. I won't embarrass anyone by saying which competition <laughs> it was, but it really happened. And obviously there is a difference in the quality or the respect you give that wine competition with Decanter World Wine Awards, for example. Right. You know, there's serious people tasting. And so, uh, and there's a big difference between Chances Robinson, who one reads and who's a goddess and, and really um, uh, defies, uh, um, um, you know, she's, she's uh, a pearl that's lasted so long uh, in the business with a, a certain honesty and uh, uh, a correctness which you which you can follow yes. and of course wine criticism is not a it's not a horizontal uh tasting you can't compare scores across different critics you have to pick you know you can't say this 90 against this 93 against this 95 you can only do it vertically uh with the same critic so if you choose your critic that you like and you follow that critic uh then i suppose it's okay because you're comparing like with like like with like yes. um but and the last thing that I want to say is that wine criticism is a business. Competitions are a business. Someone's making money. So um, you have to take it all with a pinch of salt. And wine criticism is a very fine line between 
what is okay and uh, bribery. Very fine line. I mean, you're entertained for lunch by a winery or you're sent a bottle at home, or you, you know, there's, there's, there's not very strict rules. Um, so that the, uh, the critic that goes out to really show that he's impartial, as Robert Parker did when he began, um, should be respected. But overall, to summarize, I don't like points myself. I realize consumers like it. I realize wineries love it, and that's why they exist. Um, and um, I don't take them too seriously. And people tasting that amount of wine. I, I, we, this week, we had the Sommelier Wine Exhibition in Israel. And there were some wine writers going around with little pads, writing everything down, and uh, you know, looking very professional. And, uh, and I felt after I tasted uh, a certain number of wines, all the wines started tasting the same. Yes, yes. Not the time, not the place to do a tasting. So um, everyone does their own thing, but I, but I think uh, it's very hard to taste a lot of wines. Um, and it's very hard to do it, uh, uh, you know, to taste that amount of wines in a, in a day. I know that people like Robert Park and Jancis Robinson can do it because I've seen them do it uh, and they're amazing, but I, but I can't. I mean, I, start, I lose concentration after a certain time. So um, I respect those with the image that do it and, and provide something which, is, uh, which reveals something to help us, the minnows, understand something. Um, but as, as, a, as a concept, I, I don't have a lot of respect. Uh, and as a writer, I certainly don't believe in, in scoring wines. I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I, would, I feel is right at all. So... I would say, as us mere mortals, we shall leave it to the uh, to the gods and goddesses to to that's, tackle that's that, right. that issue. And of course, the reason it it succeeds is because there is a market for it. Yes. And I, you know, I explained as a winery guy, I was the first to say, "Oh, we got a good score and to publish it." So, so um, that's why the system works because uh, it's important for the wineries. It's important for the consumers. Uh, I've seen consumers going around a supermarket with a book open, checking the scores to see, you know, people, people use them. And so um, it's there and people can use them if they want and, uh, or not. But I, right. I'm pretty cynical about it. Now, Adam, my last question to you. You've shared with us some of the experiences, oh, not all, and I wish we could spend more time. But I know that um, many of us, would like to know if you had the choice of a perfect, if one does exist, but the perfect meal with the perfect wine pairing for you. Perhaps there could be two or three options. What would they be? Wow. Um, firstly, I'm I'm uh, I'm a bit of a philistine. Um, I've always <laughs> hardly, uh, sir, hardly. <laughs> uh, no, but when I write, uh, I write for a newspaper, not for a not for a wine magazine. And I'm known for trying to take the pretentiousness and snobbism out of wine. So I, I frequently write, drink what you like, it doesn't matter. It will go with the food. Yes. And I have to say, throughout my career, I've drunk the wine with I want, with the food that I want, and I've never had a problem. So um, I, think that, um, I think that matching food and wine is a sort of uh, something we do for fun. But in practice... I think most people buy the wine that they want, and um, if you if we if we want a, um, uh, something made in heaven, which is very personal to me, um, uh, a, a good right British Stilton and a nice vintage port uh, to me is a, is a match made in heaven. And if ever you want to show someone that wine with food can be one and one equals three, that's a very good place to start. And, and Stilton, of course, is my, is my British roots, um, uh, where I was until I was 32. So, uh, yes. you know, uh, a blue, uh, famous blue cheese. Um, yes. And uh, port is, uh, you know, what the, the Brits drank a lot in, uh, in the time gone by. Um, so I think that's a pretty good example of, uh, of wines. Um, and um, in Israel, Israeli cuisine is... Uh, is an enormous variety 
of small dishes, spice and and um, um, uh, different little canopies and uh, um, you know the what they call the meze, the meze, the mezeti, the meze, uh, which is the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and something that goes very well with those, which is a wine that people, which is sort of pretty lost in in, in Israel, doesn't appear much, is is fino sherry, which I think uh, is oh, a yes, wonderful fino product, sherry. which goes which goes well. Um, I, I'm um, I think that um, what's quite fun is is tasting different wines and being surprised that something goes with it. But I I, I tend not to make a cathedral of, of wine pairing, which I used to when I was younger, and I used to be involved in wine service in the in the hotel, and and the, running the wine competition. Of course, matching wine to food was something that I did all the time because I thought it was part of the enjoyment. Now I realize that it's it's um, almost uh, a bar to the jet to the general customer uh, enjoying because it builds up this smoke screen of of knowledge you know if people if you ask them what do you think of the wine they will say to you oh I don't I don't really know about wine uh, uh, but uh, which they never do with food and the reason they do that is because of us because we've been educating them that uh, wine has a certain language and a certain knowledge and you have to be you have to be able to talk the game, to partake of it, um, which is which is a pity. So in my early life, I was very um, uh, enjoyed building up this bar uh, being part of this club, and discussing wine, matching wine with sauces and herbs and spices, or the, the pro pro prominent ingredient of a dish. Now I've suddenly realised it doesn't really matter. Uncork a bottle and enjoy it, and if it's the wine you want, it's okay. You will, you know, you're, no one's going to say, oh, it was a terrible match to this food, unless it's, you know, smoked fish and uh, uh, tannic red or something. Right. But um, so I, I'm far more relaxed um, about uh, um, creating an ivory tower of excellence in, in matching. I think now it's more important just open a bottle and enjoy it, enjoy it. and uh, take it for what it is and learn about it. But don't feel you have to have a certain a certain knowledge before you can partake in this in this game. So Absolutely. this is this is uh, slightly, you know, I've, I've got to a different uh, angle uh, yes. these days where I try to to uh, to take pretension out and uh, uh, get people to relax. You know, it's just fermented grape juice. Enjoy it, Adam Montefiore. It's been an immense pleasure having this interview with you. And uh, I, there's one word I would say is uh, uh, muzzle tov. Please comment, like, share, or subscribe to our videos.